What's up guys, I'm Matt here and we're looking at handling data today. So we can start off with uh, Edexcel uh, question on frequency polygons, everyone's favourite. Now when these come up there is only one way of answering them and I think some students um, unfortunately have forgotten what a frequency polygon uh, is by the time they get to this question. Um, a frequency polygon is not a bar chart, uh, which I see a lot when this question comes up. Um, and it's it's kind of like a line graph, but um, if you have a look uh, at the first thing in the table, um, it's actually 130 to 140, including 140, not including 130. So you're given a range. Now, um, it's really important where you plot um, this coordinate. Um, so we've got a, a height of 4. Uh, like the uh, 4 on the y-axis and on the x-axis well is it going to be 130 is it 140 well actually it's somewhere in between it's it's actually at the midpoint um, now the reason some people get confused is because uh, cumulative frequency you always plot at the maximums so on a cumulative frequency graph you plot it at 140 but with a frequency polygon you plot it at the midpoints so we're going to do 4 to and 135 across. Uh, next one's going to be 145. Uh, next one is going to be at 24. And the last one is, oh no, the next one's going to be at 22. Get ahead of myself there. And then the last one's at 19. So it has to be plotted midpoints. So you just put coordinates at the midpoints of each of the groups. But then you also have to join them up with straight lines, and it has to be straight lines. So let's pick a different colour to join them up. So you just join them up with straight lines with a ruler. And so it's not a curve or anything like that. It's just joining them up with straight lines. And sometimes you'll see people kind of put them down to the bottom here. That's absolutely fine. Um, I, I wouldn't bother. Um, it's not, not ever required that you do that. Um, but some people are like, well, 180, there's no more after that, so we'll put it down to zero there. Fine. Just don't. <laughs> the most common wrong answer to this, apart from bar charts or anything like that, is people... Oh, and let's undo that. Uh, and people do this. They join it up like that. And because they, they see the word polygon and they go, oh, it must be a polygon. No, don't ever do that. That's not what they're asking for. In fact, you will definitely lose a mark if you do that. So it's really important that you don't join up. That's it. I've talked enough about frequency polygon. Let's move on. Next up, we've got our question from OCR. And this is on sampling. Um, and it says that um, George, as a manager of shoe shop, uh, asked 50 customers uh, what their favorite shoe is or what would they would buy next. And that's the outcome. Um, so this list here is for 50, um, but he's going to buy a thousand pairs of shoes. So there's 50 and he's going to buy a thousand and he's looking at buying like the shoes that people want, right? Um, so we just got to figure out how to get from um, 50 to a thousand really. Um, and there's two, like two ways of doing it. You can times that by two to make it 100 and times it by 10 uh, to make it 1,000. Okay, times two would be 100, times 10 would be 1,000. Or you can just go straight there and times it by 20, either way. <laughs> but this is on non calculator. Paper five on OCR is non calculator. So you'd have to do this without a calculator, which is fine. 1,000 divided by 50 is 20. So therefore all we do with the sandals uh, is we just got to times it by 20. Simple as that. So to times by 20 times by 2 would be 16 times by 10 would be 160. So uh, 160. But it then says write down any assumption you made or that he made or you made about his sample. So what assumption did we make? So imagine George buys all these shoes in that in that proportion. Have a think about why they might not all sell out. You know, even though you know they seem like a logical uh, thing, and it, this is just a question about understanding samples, um, and just think back to that lesson you had on sampling, 
um, and think back to when the word representative was used. And what representative means is that the sample isn't biased in any other way, um, that it's truly random. So you imagine um, going down the high street at midday on a Monday. <laughs> this is before the current situation we find ourselves in as a society. But just in, like last year on a Monday midday and you're asking people questions about, I don't know, schools or whatever, you're not going to find any young people or many young people down the high street because they're all at school. And you're not going to find many, I don't know, office workers there or, or anything like that. Generally speaking, you're going to find, you know, um, uh, parents with their very young children um, who are kind of looking after them or or older people, retired people. So the people you're asking isn't representative um, of the society as a whole. I'm talking way too much about this, but basically the people you ask need to be completely like a cross-section of, of all the customers. So what he could have done is asked in the morning when actually the, the mix of customers in the morning isn't the same as the mix of customers in the afternoon. Or he could have asked it at a weekend where you know, um, they're not the same mix of customers he'd get in the week. So I'd probably keep my answer to this quite um, vague because it, it doesn't really give you much to go on. So um, um, probably something like he assumed, or I assumed, the sample was and rep representative and probably you know um, and probably add a bit and not biased and you know, words like representative and biased are words they're looking for so they're definitely words as a marker it makes it very easy because if I if I see someone said that you assumed it's not biased I got to write tick straight away I don't even think about it um, so it just shows understanding of, of how important it is that a sample um, is representative and uh, the way the random comes in is if you pick a truly random sample the theory is that if every single member of the population has a chance to be you know in the hat have their name in the hat and you pick it randomly then the theory says that what you pick should be random. As long as you've got a big enough sample, which uh, 50 customers is, is a big enough sample. If you'd pick like three customers, then that would be not good. Um, but as long as you pick a big enough sample, then if you do it randomly, and the important thing is that every single member of the population, all of his customers should have had a chance to be pulled out of the hat. So what he should have done is... Um, got his database of customers, printed out all their names, put it into a hat, and then taken out 50 randomly. Uh, I don't know whether he did that, but that's probably what he should do. Right, I've talked way too much about sampling, but it is uh, an area of, of maths that people often don't understand. And there's some really easy marks to be had as long as you use the keywords like representative, not biased, random sample, big enough sample is a common one. Let's move on. And our final questions from AQA, and this is a beautiful question. My, uh, I donned my hat to the person who wrote this question um, because it seems so simple, and yet uh, it, it's a little bit harder than, than it looks. And there's a reason this is question 10 on a higher paper. Thankfully, it's a calculator paper, um, but it, it's, yeah, it's got, it takes a while to get your head around. Um, so... Uh, essentially we're given a pie chart which pie charts never show amounts they show proportions so obviously looking at that pie chart uh, more women than men uh, voted in an election so we can tell that but we can't tell how many women how many men we just know that there were more women it could have been that there were three people who voted actually there couldn't be because you couldn't get 110 degrees but anyway it could be very small amounts it could be very high amounts the only piece of information that gives us any information about frequency is this one here so this is going to be quite an important one okay so we know how many more women voted than men and um, I'm just going to say this now there are loads of ways of answering this question if you've got a much easier method for you 
that you look at and go, oh, that's way easier. Stick with it as long as you get the right answer. This method I'm going to show, um, I've kind of tested on people and have found this is the easiest way that, that the people I've talked to have understood this. So I'm going to go with it. So the first thing to do is create like a, a, a fake slice. And this fake slice is going to be <clears throat> part of the women and it's going to be 110 degrees. Okay, so we're going to like cut the women's uh, slice into, into, well, it's not exactly a half, but cut it down the middle so that we've got the slice that is exactly the same as the men. Okay, now we've got to work out what is left. Okay, and this represents how much more women voted than men okay and to do that obviously uh, in a, on a circle uh, it adds up to 360 so we're going to take away the 110 plus the 110 so get my calculator out now 360 take away brackets 110 plus 110 and that gives me 140 so we know that this is going to be 140 degrees here let's put little equals 140 there Okay, that 140 degrees represents 3,360 people, okay? Because 3,360 more women voted than men. And we've taken out the same proportion of women than men. So that 110 degrees we're not looking at. We're only looking at 140 degrees. So what we're going to do next is we're going to get that 3,360, which is the amount, and divide it by the angle okay so 3360 divided by 140 and that will tell us what one degree is worth so one degree equals 24 people okay so if one degree is worth 24 people we're asked to find the uh, total number of voters Okay, not what one degree is, the total amount. So to find out the total amount, we obviously want to work out 360 degrees, okay, which is the full uh, angles in the circle. So all we're going to do is get that 24 and times it by 360. So 24 times 360, which gives me 8,640 people. Now, as I said, there are loads and loads of different ways of visualizing it. I've seen it done with algebra, and that's absolutely fine if you feel like you need to go down that way. I've seen um, it done with fractions and proportions. Um, all the other methods I've seen have completely, like, um, the, person, the, the student has completely understood and is very, very happy with, so I'd never tell them to change. But their working out has been much longer. Um, this to me is is the simplest because it's the least amount of working out uh, and really every stage of working out that you write uh, is a possibility you might get something wrong so if you've got a method that gets you to the answer quicker with less stages of working out then it, it might end up being better but it's up to you but that is the method I would choose uh, and hopefully it's the method that easily comes across to you to understand well we're gonna stop it right there for today's video uh, and this was you know on paper an easier topic but i hope that you've seen that actually it doesn't have to be that easy especially like even with pie charts they don't need to be um, easy and they don't often come up as a nice easy question um, if you've liked this video if you found it useful please click like if you want to see more from us we release videos every single weekday monday to friday and we've got a few other series in the works um, that uh, we're looking into, so please click subscribe if you want to see more from that. Obviously, uh, go to our website if you want to see more resources completely for free. We don't charge for anything on onmaths.com, and there's probably a card up there for you to click on if you so wish. We'll see you tomorrow, and thank you very much.